Um, good evening, everyone. I think we're going to make a start. Um, I'd like to begin first by thanking Sally Berkovic very much for providing us with the idea of interviewing Joanna. Um, for those who are interested in knowing more about Sally, we did one of these interviews. Just a bit for a moment. Um, we did one of these interviews last year with Sally. Um, it's on the Shul YouTube channel. Do watch it if you haven't already. This is the second in conversation with in this series of three. Um, please watch the first again on the Shul YouTube channel and on US TV, which was two weeks ago, um, with Baron William of Oystermouth, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And the third and final one in two weeks' time on the 1st of March will be with Lord Ian Austin, the former Labour MP, um, which was deferred from our previous series last year. Now, allow me to introduce Joanna Benaroche, someone with whom I've had the pleasure of working for many years. Joanna was chief of staff of Rabbi Sachs's office during the latter period of his chief rabbinate, and she is now the chief executive of the Rabbi Sachs Legacy Trust. Joanna, good evening, and thank you very much you, for joining you. us. Um, I know that you are um, well known to probably pretty much everyone who is watching. So let's get going. So Thank I you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, I think that um, people are going to be interested, not just in your relationship with Rabbi Sachs, but about you too. Um, and Kazu, could you tell us a little bit about your background um, and early career? Um, I can. Um, I grew up in northwest London. Um, was, my first primary school was Kerem. Um, then I, we spent a little while in Bournemouth and went to Menorah, then I went to Menorah Primary and ended up in JFS, much to uh, Menorah's dismay. Um, but that's, that was my parents' decision. It's probably the, the making of me at the time. Um, and I got married very young, got married um, almost just out of school. Um, I first sort of one of the things you were you were asking me about uh, Rabbi Bilofsky is it's how I first um so I'm going to jump the gun how I first encountered Rabbi Sachs and um it was very interesting because I um and Riley Close shouldn't take this the wrong way but I was turned down for a job um there in 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 1993 I think it was and I was sitting around um the Shabbos table actually with um Simma Weinberg and I was telling her my disappointment. She's her, um, someone very close to her became my sister-in-law. So we had a very close relationship. And um, I told her, you know, I really, really would have liked to work within the community. And she said, well, actually, do you want to know about something really exciting that um, the chief rabbi is just setting up? It's called Jewish Continuity. Would you be interested in putting your name forward? Would you be interested in coming for an interview? Um, and that was my entry into the life and world of um, Chief Rabbi um, Dr. Jonathan Sachs, as he was at the time, um, set up this incredible um, organization, which was sort of reaching out across the community. Um, he felt very strongly when he took office that um, our community was, unfortunately, was looking backwards at the, the heyday that it used to be, um, and that he needed to bring it kicking and screaming into the 20th century and think about Jewish education. Um, so he set up this organization um, and it wasn't just focused on education, but Jewish pride, Jewish responsibility, a love of Judaism in whatever form that might take. Um, and um, I can see you're smiling, um, Rabbi Belosky. I think it's something very specific, but do carry on. <laughs> go on, go on. Well, I think very specifically that it did try in its early days to reach out to all kinds of people. And I will never forget an occasion which you probably know about when Michael Sinclair and Clive Lawton were dispatched to Gates of Yeshiva uh, to visit, perhaps a little ill-conceived as to what they thought it might produce. So I was a Talmud in Gates of Yeshiva at the time, and the Yeshiva had no idea what to do with these people. So when people who spoke English um, turned up, as they always did, they tapped me on the shoulder and said, would I come and meet them? And this was my, this was my first as long, as, long as, as long as they didn't I just hope the mic does remember it. Because I've got no idea what I said, but I do recall that uh, um, the reason I'm smiling is because this was quite unforgettable because, let's say, it didn't go quite, quite as It wasn't quite as, as, no. 
I think it's it stirred up a lot of interest in the community. I think there was a lot of excitement um, in Anglo Jewry at the time, and it it it, it had its time. Um, and there were some very great organisations were set up as Thank a result you. of continuity, um, and like the Manchester Puppet Theatre. Um, I can remember one one thing, but there. But um, I think out of that came J Link. Um, the UJIA took on uh, um, an education and home focus as opposed to being just focused on Israel. Um, so there were some amazing things that came out of it. And we, we supported some wonderful um, endeavours. I think we, we had Aish dinners um, in our lovely off, open plan offices in Bell's Eyes Park. Um, but it was, that was an amazing work, it sort of entry into Jewish communal life. Um, and um, it was an exciting period to be an Anglo jury, whether it couldn't carry on as it was, but we, they really did some, there were some incredible projects that came out of it. So what was, um, your, what was your role in Jewish continuity? Um, so I was taken on as uh, one, of the, uh, one of two administrators, um, but, the, but the team grew. Um, and then I became sort of office manager. Um, I didn't have um, any, real qualifications at the time, but we had the most amazing treasurer, um, Howard Stanton, and he noticed that I had quite a flair for figures and I actually took over sort of the financial side of it from Michael Mayle, who was the Chief Operating Officer um, of Jewish Continuity, um, started creating Excel spreadsheets, which um, nobody was really that familiar with at the time. Um, and, and as a result of that, and I, I credit Howard Stanton for, for seeing my interest, um, that I became an accountant, sort of qualified as an accountant whilst I was working in the Chief Rabbi's office, but Howard encouraged me. Um, I think that was, you know, the feeling in, within continuity was one of encouragement and, and um, pursuing your dreams, which whatever those dreams might be. Um, but it was an amazing environment to become a Jewish communal professional. Um, and I've remained one ever since, so it couldn't have been all that bad. So you said that you'd been disappointed that you didn't get the job in Hendon, which led on to this wonderful opportunity, but what motivated you to work in the community in the first place? So I think um, as, a, as a family, I grew up in a very community-minded family. Um, my grandparents had the, around the Green Park Hotel, owned the Green Park Hotel in Bournemouth, um, of which you would meet all types of um, Anglo jury. Um, and we've seen the film. <laughs> and you've seen the film. Um, and it was it was the most amazing um, upbringing, you know, as far as I was concerned, until I met my husband and had first Seder at his parents in Bournemouth, I thought Cesarim were always 200 people. I didn't have a clue that um, you could have a small family Seder. Um, but you also learnt um, to respect all manner of jury um, and and non-Jews. I mean, we we had an amazing relationship and saw the way that my grandparents treated the staff in the hotel. Everybody was part of the family and everyone was treated with great respect. Um, so, you know, it was always very, we, we were a very communally minded family. So when I had this opportunity, um, I jumped at the chance. And of course, Simmer sold it to me, um, as you would have expected. Oh, yes. Yes, no, Asuma was an extraordinarily hard person to turn down. And I was honoured to be asked. Um, so it was... And so you ended up in a kind of, a kind of you know, a, 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 was executive role in Jewish continuity. And then some years on, you find yourself as um, Chief Rabbi Sachs's right hand, and perhaps if I'd be so bold, uh, minder and gatekeeper. And so that transition, when did you eventually, what, what stage did you take over effectively running his office? Um, so I, um, I took over in 2010, Simmer, Simmer moved to Israel in 2009 and by, um, and everybody made assumptions that I would follow in her footsteps and I couldn't imagine ever doing so. I had a you know, youngish family of four, um, and I saw the hours and the dedication that she put in. And, um, but a year later, having, I had the opportunity to sort of throw my hat into the ring. Um, I, I felt that there, was, there were things that I, that I could do. And, um, and I, I actually sort of wrote a letter 
to say, would, would you consider um, me for this position? And um, to my shock and horror, um, and I just, I will take you, I'll take you back a tiny bit um, to me joining the chief rabbi's office. So um, I actually, and this is, you know, I look back on this with, you know, sort of shock and horror, um, but I actually went to my interview with the chief rabbi, um, with Simmer, um, I think soon after he'd actually got up from Shiva for his father um, in December 1997, 96, um, early pregnant with number three, so I took Jewish continuity very seriously, um, and with a broken ankle, and yet I'm still still here to tell the town, and it was it was extraordinarily forward thinking of him. Um, to think that you know not not only did I have a role to play but um he respected what Simmer and I had done and work the work we had achieved in continuity and he wanted us in his office and actually Simmer when she was offered the job of, of executive director in the office she said only if I could come with um because she knew there was quite a job to do on the on the admin side and the financial side um when we took over so um we were a real sort of dynamic duo and it was a it was a privilege and honor to learn from the very best um so so i took over in 2010 and um and I, unfortunately one of the first things i had to deal with was um rabbi sachs lost his mother first night sukkus and um she wasn't buried in israel until holomod and it was a three-day yomta so it was it was a really tough time, really tough time, and it was very very hard um, for him to to get up from Shiva and start getting back to work. And and I think um, you know we really encouraged him to to carry on. And afterwards, he said to me, it was the absolute right thing because your instinct is to just shut yourself away. Um, and I think those times, you know, he showed great trust um in us his staff and we were part of an, an incredible team supporting him but we he set an example that you just can't imagine I mean you you will have seen the output of what what he achieved over the years he was an incredibly prolific writer um but he was the most hard-working person I think I've ever ever come across he pushed himself um at every level um, to deliver, to work hard, to to produce the material, but the preparation into absolutely everything that he did, whether it was a three people meeting round his round table, wobbly table on Hamilton Terrace, um, to a sermon in shul, um, of which we know he always came prepared, Rabbi Belovsky, uh, just in case he might be tapped on the shoulder. He always told me that he had one in his pocket, just in case. Um, to a lecture of thousands, he put in the preparation, he wanted to know who his audience was, he never ever expected to take something off the peg, he always said I, everything has to be tailor made, um, because my audience want to hear what they need to hear, not what I want to tell them. I think, you know, we, and the, the fact that he pushed himself and learnt from everything that he did every day, whether it was conversations with people whether it was the books he read or the lectures he listened to or you know voraciously reading the news and articles and op-eds um to music he you know he was an incredibly uh, you know there there is no one i don't think that ever in my lifetime that i will ever meet that comes close I was thinking about this, but, you know, I was somewhat exposed to his voracious reading, not just the, re the breadth, but the speed at which he seems to get through things and have absorbed the content and be able to kind of reproduce it, use it, understand it and critique it. Um, and but he also seemed to be up to date with politics, philosophy, you know, economics, psychology. Um, and, you know, we've, we've mentioned music as well. I think, you know, I've. I spoke to him about music interests, which were far broader than I'd realised into kind of a little insight. And he, towards the end of his life, he made a number of comments in public about music interests, which uh, was surprising. And I also was particularly, you know, we were very fortunate to be invited to the Templeton ceremony when he won the Templeton Prize. Um, and, and, and the music selections there were also kind of rather memorable and quite extraordinary. How do you keep up with this? 
uh, with great with great difficulty. Um, he kept Amazon in business. I'm convinced of it. Um, there were, but it, it was incredible. I think um, Dan and I, um, and Dan will remind me afterwards. I can't remember the name of the app, but there was an incredible app where um, it summarizes a book um, in in a very short period of time. But we could you, never you ever Blinkist. Blinkist is the one. Um, so very good. Um, so you know of it. Um, mm-hmm. But we could certainly not not ever ever match um, the breadth and depth of his. It was, as you said, it was an encyclopedic knowledge and a depth. So there was never, you know, there was never top line. He wanted to know exactly what was underneath. He was reading beneath the the waves, if you like. And, you know, it was, I I was always staggered. I mean, um, you talk about the Templeton Prize um, and that event. Uh, I'll never forget having to have such difficult conversations with the most wonderful team at the Templeton Prize, I have to say the most patient group of women that you've ever come across in your life. And I had to tell them they always like to do things around May time. And um, that year, the way uh, the Omer fell, um, and they always there's always music involved. I had to call them up and say, there's one specific date in the month of May that we could have music. And they said, okay, could you explain a little bit more? So I told them, explains about the Omer, so respectful, so happy to, to manage the, the time to, to, to meet our diary requirements. Um, and they, they, I think it was Lugba Omer probably that we, we did it on or after, after Lugba Omer. Um, but they were so, so thoughtful. And, but as far as they were concerned, music was integral. So they would do whatever they could to, they to didn't help expect, us. They didn't expect it to sing. They did not expect him to sing. No, I think that's clear. And he may, I don't, he, I don't know if he was the first um, recipient of the prize to sing. Probably, so he won't forget it. Um, um, we tend to focus on his public roles, which I'm going to return soon. But I know that he, Boaz Sachs, Zuhair of Rocha, and Elaine. Um, had a special relationship with your family, encouraging your children, celebrating their successes with you and Bernard. Um, can you elaborate a little on this? So it was, we were, we were just so excited when they moved to Golders Screen um, because they were a 20 minute walk from us and they graced our sukkah every year, um, just until not the year that he passed away. Um, and so we had, I think, six um, sukkah visits from him, which were so memorable. And the, the kids loved having him. And he listened and held court and wanted to wanted to know what all of them were doing and, and thrilled our guests um, with his visits. And it was just such a privilege to, to have him in, in our home and such a treat. Um, but he also, he really you know, wanted to know what my kids were up to. And he was with us for um, for my youngest son's bar mitzvah. He, he wasn't around for Zach's because he was in Israel. Um, when um, privately I told Rashi, uh, told uh, Elaine that my daughter Rashi had uh, won three prizes in her second year in Kings. Um, I got in the car the following morning and he said, why didn't you tell me? I don't understand. You told Elaine? Um, and he said, and he insisted I got Rashi on the phone. I think it was on the way there or, to or from thought for the day. So it was quite early in the morning. I had to get Rashi on the phone there and then so he could call and wish a Mazatov. But he was so proud of, of all of their achievements and wanted to know, always asking me where they were up to and what they were doing. Um, my daughter Rashi um, had a baby just before he passed away and he was calling me every day. Um, she was born in July, calling me every day. Well, any news, I, said, I promise. I'll call you and let you know as soon as she has the baby. But he he got a lot of nachos from from them, and um, he was very it was very sweet. He um, actually governed um, I think Musaf in Dunstan Road um, for one of the a family the mitzvah, and he called my son Zach, who governs quite a bit, and asked him to record a few things for him. And Zach was very touched um, that he wanted him to teach him. So he he had an incredible ability to to you know and we heard this over you know unfortunately after after he passed away the incredible outpouring of love from people whose lives he touched sometimes they had 
first-hand encounters with him and we were blessed to have many um, but sometimes it was just a one-off or a phone call or an email um, he had the ability to touch people in such a way that he really focused on them and made them feel that they were the center of his world at that moment um, and really gave them very considered thought and care and really focused um, incredibly on on them at that point so I think you know we were very blessed to have several encounters and actually one of the saddest things um, my youngest recently said to me said mum I feel that I've I missed out on having the opportunity to ask Rabbi Sachs all my big questions and he just wasn't mature and old enough to think those things through and now that he's reading lots of his books he feels that he missed out on that opportunity um and that's it's it's hard for me to to hear that i'm going to flip back a little i know that people who are watching will be fascinated to go a little deeper into what it was like working with him on a day-to-day -day basis so clearly there are some things you can't disclose and we don't expect you to disclose. Um, but perhaps you could give a few insights into kind of what it was like working him, with him when you were in charge of his office in the latter part of his chief rabbinate and then perhaps a little how this relationship changed um, in the final years when he was... Rabbi Blofsky throws a noise at me. Oh, I'll answer what his what, question. Yeah, yeah I'm going to uh, answer because I can see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so during the Chief Rabbinate, we had a pretty strict schedule um, that we had to, to, to adhere to. Um, we had set times in the diary when when uh, he had... Fine. So there's some, for viewers, so there was a, there was a, there was a, a brief... Um, I think intermission in the service. Can you see me? Yes, yes. So I hope everyone's back. Okay. I'm just checking out the internet connection. It may have been the same, but I think we are back. So apologies. And yes. um, did you hear the question? Yes, I heard the question. And I started to answer it. We've not heard. I certainly didn't hear the beginning of the answer. So if you wouldn't mind beginning the answer again. Yeah, of course. So um, during Chief Rabinet, um, and particularly in the last three years, we were planning. He told. Um, us, um, I think in 2011, that he was planning to step down in 2013. So really those last two years were planning um, sort of the whistle-stop tour um, of the United Kingdom, um, particularly focusing. We, we really planned very, very carefully so that we visited as many communities as he possibly could before he stepped down. Um, so much so that I think, um, in, I think our visit to Edgware, we covered three communities when we did Muswell Hill and Kinloss and, and um, Norris Lee, I think on one Shabbos. We, we, we learned to really cluster the diary, but he also had very fixed times for doing certain things. And one thing that I'll, that I'll tell you that um, I think was really special, and I've heard from lots of the young Rabonim, um, even during his lifetime, we talked about it, is the time that he set aside on Friday mornings, um, specifically that, that any of the rabbis knew that they could arrange time to speak to him, that he made himself available. I think also, you know, whenever he visited a community, the, the fact that he praised the rabbi and gave them encouragement in, the, in front of their communities to bolster them and show the communities how much they should value the work the Rav does uh, for for the Kahila. Um, but he pushed himself, you know, even with his punishing schedule of crazy diary of visits and and and, and different engagements, um, he set aside time for writing um, every day. Um, he had very strict schedules and, and pushed himself extremely hard. And, and as, you know, as I said previously, and about how Trollope wrote in very in his slots, and he he spoke many times about this, about how you admired it. Didn't quite manage to attain Trollope's kind of no, no. certain number of words and certain number of minutes, but he clearly no. mentioned it sufficiently yeah. that he obviously saw this as an objective. And I'm sure you remember his um, his his the Trollope story. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think he 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 really pushed himself to to deliver, and it, and it was pretty difficult writing amongst that crazy schedule. 
Um, you know, and he set himself... had to do. He, is a post, he was a postmaster, and the rest of the time he wrote, <laughs> whereas our sack said very many more commitments. Very many more commitments. Exactly, exactly. And and the commitments that Rabbi Sachs had requires him to do a huge amount of preparation for each of those commitments. Um, so, you know, he carries on, you know, Coven's conversation. You know, we, we would say to him, you know, can you do a few for the freezer? Um, but uh, but those, you know, those carries on. And thought for the day, you didn't get to write that until the day before because it had to be topical on message um, and under the very um, watchful eye of the BBC to make sure that you, you know, kept within their guidelines. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of that one. Um, but they, but they said, you know, thought for the day had no right, right to reply. So you couldn't say anything, you know, that was too, um, well, couldn't say anything that was controversial, but Rabbi Sachs wouldn't, but he would, he, he got the message out there in a very, in a very carefully um, measured way with a certain tonality for, for the BBC listener um, and producer. Um, but I think, you know, he, he used every moment of his day with such care. So, you know, he's get in the car um, on the way to an event and you think oh gosh you know is he just writing notes on the one that's coming up no he was probably four events ahead um, and whilst feedback for him was very important so he always wanted to know how he could do better um, so I you know that the the amount of times that I'd make a call not say Shabbat to various communities you know how did it go this this weekend and, and they would expect my call um, and he'd Sunday morning he'd want to know how did I do he wanted that feedback he never rested on his laurels always wanted to know how to do to do better and how was he listening did the message come across to people understand um, often his sermons were road testing an idea um, which would later become either a lecture series or probably a book um, but it was always, he was always looking for ways to improve and better himself. And I think that was, you know, but also I think one of the things which um, always amazed me um, is how much he respected our opinion, wanted to know what we thought um, and what could we add. And he always, you know, we'd, we'd, come into the office in the morning and you know you've no idea apart from the things that were going on that day what what might what might come at you um and he's cool and he'd have tell us about sort of probably the 64th idea that he would had since breakfast and um want to know what we thought um road tested an idea sometimes they were absolutely brilliant but we said you know you, we need to stick to the knitting um but other times they were phenomenal ideas um you know the the um his compilation for israel the two the the two collection cd um yeah. that was just in his and that was his love of music but that required a huge amount of work i don't think any of us quite understood what was what how much work that was going to take but um it's still beloved today um and actually one of the things that he said to us um in creating that is he said do me a favor and make sure that my words aren't linked to the music which i thought was staggering and i said but why chief rabbi people want to hear he said i want them to be able to skip to the music if they want to they don't need to listen to my voice well just thinking ahead i mean that how did this change after he was uh, let's step down but also it was evident um, but also somewhat the, the, the chief rabbinate clearly provided him with an extraordinary and unparalleled uh, platform and opportunity, but it also confined him in ways that changed after he stepped down. How is it different in, in the remaining years when he was no longer uh, constrained by, I by, think he was, by, by he the was, chief of office? Yeah, I think he was, he was much more relaxed. He was much less concerned um, about who, you know, the kind of messages that he put across. I mean, he was always deeply respectful um, and was very cautious not to step into any uh, communal debates on, on anything. I remember um, we spent quite a lot of time in the States after he stepped down to make sure that he gave space um, for um, his successor, for, for, for Chief Rabbi Mervis. But 
Um, I remember one of once he spoke in there, well, several times he spoke in what was called the Downtown Minion um, in in um, Washington Square around NYU, where he would spend significant amounts of time. And um, they called me up and they said, um, OK, so the topic this week for his um, sermon will be the Arab. I said, I don't think so. Um, so they said, well, why not? And there was a huge discussion going on at the time about the era of in New York um, and how far down it reached and who agreed with what. And he would not step into a communal debate of that nature. That was a local issue, which um, he avoided at all costs um, because he didn't feel that it was his place. Um, he wasn't a Rav in the area, um, and, but, he, but it gave him a certain freedom to talk about other issues and and gave him the ability to write not in god's name which he wouldn't have done whilst he was chief rabbi um and i think you know that it was the the first i think it was maybe the first or second book that he wrote after he stepped down um and he it also gave him the ability to to for us to to be able to um propel is the wrong word but to allow him to speak on social media and and I think that really allowed him to speak to a more global audience. Um, you know, we what we used to call it, you know, sort of um, globe trotting without the the jet lag. You know, he he really had the opportunity to speak, and and COVID showed showed that to us as well. The ability to speak to a much wider audience than just a local sort of geographically placed um, audience. Yeah. Yes. Um... And this touches somewhat on just a very brief one, which is, uh, you know, reflecting on um, interacting with you over the years when he was chief rabbi and subsequent. Of course, the relationship with my family and my community changed dramatically after he stepped down as chief rabbi um, because, um, to our delight, the Hindu Lane relocated to Gold, came back to Golders Green to the, his old stomping ground. Um, and, of course, but nonetheless, um, there were still ways of accessing him and ways of not accessing him. Um, and even if it wasn't necessarily very occasionally to call on Elaine's mobile. Um, nonetheless, what is I found very interesting about this is that you managed to, this is about you really rather than about him, uh, maintain the balance between access and protection and even steering him away. I, there's a particular conversation, I probably can't say what it was about, um, where I, I managed to get him to agree to something of which you clearly disproved. Um, and I can see you shaking your head and suddenly he was saying, well, maybe not, um, and so on. So I think you managed that um, very well. Um, and you were the model of discretion. For example, I've never once heard you refer to him by his first name. In fact, not anything other than other than Rabbi Sachs. And I think this is absolutely admirable that you managed to maintain his balance, but it was not in a way that frustrated access, but protected him whilst enabling him to fulfill his role properly. And this is really an observation. If you'd like to comment on that, then I'm happy for you to do so. So we, um, it was actually amazing that, that he would, uh, and there were a couple of occasions when, um, when my shaking my head um, gently, um, it wasn't encouraged him. on this occasion. It was not. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right. um, so, so um, I often got a call um, Sunday morning from someone who said, oh, I met Rabbi Sachs in Shaw and um, he promised me to do X or promised me to do Y. And, um, and I, I would have to sort of extricate him because he just didn't like saying no to anybody. I mean, even not you, Rabbi Velofsky. Um, so it, it was quite it was quite a challenge to gracefully um, extricate him from that and make the person feel that actually they never really wanted to ask him to do it in the first place. Um, and we're very grateful. You're less to successful to, uh, that to, to, with me, but okay. <laughs> but um, no, I remember. I, I mean. You, you are going to ask me about some favourite moments, but just on, on, on the shaking of the head, I remember being with him at TED and it, it covers a few things um, of the preparation that he put in. I, I didn't attend TED with him, but I did go to the rehearsal, which was an absolute eye opener. Um, they, they encourage you, the, the, each person to come and rehearse. Um, and in fact, they probably wouldn't let you on without rehearsing. They want to see you rehearsing. Um, but they encourage you to come and see somebody else rehearsing either before or after you. 
um, which is not a fun thing to do at all. Um, and so we went to see um, we went to see someone rehearsing before he rehearsed. Um, and this poor man, who is probably one of the most successful hedge fund owners in the world, um, stumbled his way through 20 minutes of, of rehearsal. Clearly wasn't quite there yet, but there was no choice. That was the time frame that he'd been given to rehearse. And they proceeded to give him 40 minutes of feedback, um, which was it was it was really quite hard to watch. But it was it was a testament to Ted. You get invited to do to, to Ted and you do an excellent um you know, um, events. So we, so I, I watched this with my heart in my mouth, knowing how much preparation he put into to writing um, his TED presentation. And he delivered it beautifully without a note. You're not allowed to stender. You cannot have anything on the stage. And delivered with such beauty and passion um, as is his want. And, um, and then we sat down and, and Chris Anderson um, came over to him. He's the, um, he, he runs Ted and he came over to him and he said, Rabbi Sachs, that was outstanding. Um, any chance that you might lose the tie? And I'm sitting behind him shaking my head madly. And so Chris looked at me, says, I'm getting a lot of negative feedback from behind you. So Rabbi Sachs looked at him and says, Chris, I can promise you, I will stick to absolutely everything on your dress code. I'm not gonna wear any dangling earrings but the tie stays um, and and Chris smiled and laughed and he said and he said the rest of the TED conference I'll take my tie off but for my presentation it's kind of who I am and that's what TED's all about you're meant to Although be who later, you are. There were later years he, I did I did see him speak without wearing it to a late but in the perhaps after late, post chief rabbi. Definitely post chief rabbi never when he was chief rabbi did he shed the tie and I think on zoom you you'd you you would have caught him a few times um, in shirt sleeves and without a jacket and tie, but it was very rare um, to see him without a tie. And it, it felt the right thing to do, but Chris was um, very, very sweet about it. Before I ask you a few kind of quick fire questions, just perhaps one um, sad reflection. Um, we've all been very deeply affected um, by Rabbi Sachs's death. Of course, the harshest impact was for Elaine and the family. But I know that it was devastating for you, having worked so closely with him and become so close to him. I won't forget the moment um, when you and I stood in a small room with just the family and Rabbi Sachs's coffin just prior to the Leviah, before we stepped out to give the family some space. Um, I don't think it's something you want to dwell on, but I felt it was we were remiss not just to ask perhaps a few reflections um, on his untimely passing. So first of all, um, I wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to cut the career. Um, I think it was something that I needed. I didn't even know that I needed to have some part. Um, and that's not to say that I didn't have some part um, in the arrangements um, of, of that horrible weekend um but it felt it felt like i and you you understood it in a way that i could not i couldn't fathom how much that meant to me um to be part of that so thank you firstly um it was pretty actually pretty unbearable um to be honest um we didn't you know, people all over the world, as I've been meeting with people recently, have asked, you know, how long before did you know? And we didn't. And we really had no inkling. And I think, you know, in even when Elaine called to tell me, you know, after various tests, what, what, what the diagnosis was, it didn't occur to us that there should be anything other than he's going to get better. He's going to react to, well to the treatment and he's going to feel it's going to take him time. But so I, I think it was just a sense of utter shock and, um, and dismay to get a call an hour or so before Shabbos to say that he didn't have long um, to live um, and total disbelief. You know, we were talking about him coming home and so 
you know, and no, no conversations have been had about, about anything. Um, so it was, I'd say unbearable was probably pretty much summed up how we felt there and then and very, very shocked. And it's, it's hard to talk about it. Um, but I think, I think that it was at that point that, you know, when I stood in Bushy on that Sunday morning, thinking what a responsibility we have, what an honor and a privilege that I will never ever forget in my entire life. Um, and it will be with me forever, this, this special time that I had, these 23 years um, that I served by his side. Um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it's something that I'm ever going to actually get over. And, but we have, we have a responsibility in his ideas and his teachings and the impact that he had on all of us and have, please God will have on generations to come, rests on us to make sure they, that future is there for his legacy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not the easiest thing to talk about. No, I appreciate um, your candor. I think it was appropriate to mention it, but let's move on. Quicker things. So go back to your role with Rabbi Sachs, and we're kind of gradually winding towards the end. Um, these are these intended to be fairly quick fire ones, not long conversations, although elaborate as you feel. So please mention your, if you can think of three favorite conversations, maybe topics rather than the actual conversations, because that would take us all night. And despite my joke at the beginning, we are certainly planning to finish before nine. <laughs> Um, three favorite conversations. So probably one of them, um, was, um, about West Wing. Um, he got me totally hooked on West Wing. He and Elaine bought me my first two, um, series to watch. Um, and I think that was one of the journeys, one of the journeys, the journeys in the car were the best times, um, when he really wanted to know what was going on um in my life in the kids life um but we would talk about all sorts of things um so um i was really trying to think about this there were just so many that it's hard to, to pick out um particular conversations um it's a slightly unfair question given there were thousands 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 um but i think i think one of the one of the conversations and it was a recurring conversation when you got off a plane He'd always want to know. So, what did you watch? Um, and 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 conversations about films when we were walking to and from an event. Um, I think I can't remember which. I think it was the Marriage Story. Um, I was walking. We were walking to record um, his. Um, he was recording um, Noss and God's name um, for the audio book. So we did a lot of walking back and forth from the studio, and. Um, and he said to me, so what have, what have you watched recently? What recommendations? And he was the one that watched, that he would say he didn't, hadn't watched anything, but, um, and um, I said- He watched I far more things than I, he was always saying, have you seen this? And he watched that. I obviously don't know what he was talking about. But, um, so I said to him, I, I really struggled finishing watching The Marriage Story. I think that was it. And he said, oh, good, so did I. Um, <laughs> he said, it was too sad. And I said, yeah, I just, it, it, it wasn't something, I, I couldn't actually, bear to listen anymore and he said good I couldn't either and then he told me uh something else that I shouldn't watch um so th those conversations were always intriguing because he didn't just watch a film for for enjoyment he wanted to know what why why was someone writing about it what motivated them what was on their minds he could always see I mean Dan will will tell you about watching the Lego movie and what he got out of that movie and Emmett yeah, yeah, he, yes, um, he, he, I remember him talking about that movie. And yeah, guests yeah. At the meal here about that. I mean, having no, the engagement with the guests, and I had no idea what he was talking about, but they'd all seen it. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so loads and loads of conversations, and, and so much did I learn from him in those conversations. Um, but it was either a book or a song or a piece of music or a. Um, or a piece of a, a piece of news, and I, I think that's one of the things that I got great joy. Um, I, before you get in the car, for thought for the day um, at seven in the morning, 
um, it's quite important to read the, the newspaper. Um, and um, I never knew whether he was actually humoring me, but if I told him something he hadn't read about or heard about, he got quite a lot of pleasure from me telling him something he hadn't read about. I'd just like to inform the audience that, that while I do, I do Pause for Thought Radio too, I go on the tube, right? There is no car. I'd just like to make that clear to the audience. Mm -hmm. I've been done at least 150 of these, and although during the pandemic they've been recorded remotely, um, I've been more than 100 times every time on the tube, no car. Rabbi Sachs but... loved going on the tube and on the bus. <laughs> yeah, right. But not at seven in the morning. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Three, you, you attended hundreds of events with him. Three most memorable events. Um, so I think it would have to be the final dinner that we um, did for him as chief rabbi. Um, that was the most um, incredible event to have um, to have put together. Um, and as we, when we look back on it, we could we were really pinching ourselves um, to think that we we pulled it off with Prince Charles um, and the Great and the Good. And it was it was a really special event. But I think I think one of the most memorable parts of the evening was keeping from him that Elaine was going to speak, and the surprise and pleasure on his in his face and and it was just incredible um and we you know he just couldn't believe that we'd kept it a secret um but it was it was a very special evening um second number two templeton prize right that was i missed just, the first one because it was our daughter's graduation at the templeton prize i was at so go yes. on, I've gone, what how was what, um what, what about that one so templeton um as i mentioned before we worked for months leading up to the event with with the Templeton Prize team. Um, but one very quick um, memory that I will share with you about Templeton. So we uh, traveled back and forth with the Templeton team quite a bit in the car with Rabbi Sachs. Uh, there were two of them that came for the prize and two of them came um, earlier when Prince Charles presented Rabbi Sachs at a private ceremony with with an award um, because he couldn't be there and we were in the back of the car and the Templeton one of the ladies leant over to Dan and I and said I cannot believe that I'm in the back of the car with Rabbi Sachs now think about previous Templeton prize winners they're not a, they're not you know an unknown bunch and she just got such pleasure knowing and he Rabbi Sachs leant over to Dan and I and to me particularly and said I don't understand, you know, what's so special? And I said, Rabbi Sachs, I pinch myself every day that I have the privilege to work for you. And he was blown away. He just, um, so that's one memory. And then the other I've re referenced is Ted. It was just the most incredible experience to, to go with him to the, to the rehearsal um, and, and see him perform so beautifully. And so that it was, it was what he'd always hoped be able to do and I think we you know we we got such pride um in him presenting it Ted okay three most memorable public figures that you met with him Prince Charles obviously um such a down-to-earth lovely person I think we I got to meet him um two or three times um once at the dinner um but also when he presented the Templeton Award to him at Clarence House, it was just such a privilege uh, to meet him. And he was he was very funny um, because when Rabbi Sachs had great pleasure in introducing us, we were, it was just the family, um, Dan, Debbie and I, who went to Clarence House for this event with the Templeton ladies. And he took great pleasure in introducing Prince Charles to all of us. And so he said to, he told Rabbi Sa uh, Prince Charles that I ran the office and he said, how do you keep up with him? <laughs> right um and it was we we met some most amazing people um over time um another another pres couple of examples president in president rivlin right it was a real privilege to meet him um i'm just trying to think who else um particularly stands out um um got um got to meet this the chief rabbis of Israel, many other chief rabbis, and actually developed some some very close relationships with chief rabbis around the world. Um, I think that's you know, and and colleagues of Rabbi Sachs. I think um, really really incredible um, to meet people you know that that he impacted um, during his lifetime. Um, 
you know, it's just, there, there, there are just so many. Okay, um, we're moving on. Can you think of any kind of three troubling or worrying moments, not, not towards the end of his life, but like in, in, in your work with him? Um, kind so, of either did go wrong or almost went wrong. So um, I don't know if you remember that far back, but um, in between March and June, 2020. I'm older um, than March and June, 2020. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, right. Um, because COVID has uh, has condensed the last Telescope couple of years. Time. Yes. Um, we were in total lockdown, and um, Rabbi Sachs quite willingly did a lot of Zoom interactions during lockdown. Um, and quite amazingly, he was very up for doing. We we were getting requests on a daily basis, and we did pick and choose the things that we did to because it was a very stressful thing to do. Um, you know, he, he'd done quite a lot on, you know, on social media, but it's a very different scenario doing something on Zoom and interacting with the audience. It's a very, it's quite difficult. Um, you don't really get the feedback, especially when you mute everyone else, you'll get just the, you know, your interlocutor and yourself and that's it. Um, but he spoke to some incredible groups. Well, those Zoom interactions were run by me from home and every time that you know sort of for the first half an hour before we connected um i was absolutely panic struck that this was resting on me to make sure that my connection to his connection to his wi-fi would actually work um and thank god i think i made a huge mistake with an hour's time difference um with somewhere in america um i got the hour um, I got an hour, one hour wrong. Um, but apart from that, um, but every time it was extremely stressful. And he was so calm and so reassuring to me, but I was literally panicked because everyone was relying on the person they didn't even know that was um, making it happen behind the scenes. So that was pretty stressful. Um, wherever we went and wherever we traveled, um, getting somewhere on time, he was very very meductic about his timekeeping um he didn't like to keep anyone waiting um and i remember a few times in the back of a car um getting stuck in traffic and um it was not um it was not a great <laughs> atmosphere shall we say he uh it just it was it was one of his things he liked to be on time and he he didn't like it when anyone was late for him and he particularly didn't like to be late for anybody else so um those were two two particularly um, troubling and, or, or worrying moments. Um, and sort of that, that third, that hours late um, was, will, will forever haunt me. <laughs> Luckily, we found out an hour before that um, my timing was off, but it meant that instead of having a break of 45 minutes to have dinner and, and think about what was next, he had 10 minutes. But um, yeah. Okay, so. and then three if you can or a couple of amusing encounters that you can remember um so one one amusing account encounter um well two actually relate to music um we i used used to have my my phone on silent and i actually i think i was so scarred from this um this that i actually sort of still keep it on silent which is probably annoying for some people that they can't get to me straight away um but i had my phone <laughs> Pardon? i can't say i've ever had that thank you never me. never ever, ever. um so we my phone was not on silent i was fixing something upstairs and on, on his computer in the office and he must have come up to check on me and my my handbag and my phone were on the other other side of his office um in the attic and it rang and my ringtone at the time was Bohemian Rhapsody uh, Queen, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. And, um, and I don't know who was more shocked, him or me. Um, it must have been in the fairly early days of my work in the Chief Rabinette. Um, so he didn't realise that I was a Queen fan. And he turned to me and said, Joanna, you like Queen? And I said to him, Chief Rabbi, you know that's Queen? <laughs> Right. And um, and then he proceeded to, as you do, give me a share on exactly how 
that particular piece of music was made and how many times they've been dubbed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that was very funny. Um, and well, I remember those conversations that he would try to try, try to under, work out what the person was trying to do. I mean, he had a phase when he was interested in bit the Beatles and he was trying to explain the kind of tension between exactly. Between, between um, the early years and, and late years, and about, yes. and about and how, and yes. how, how, how and manifests so, a particular song, you absolutely. might remember. And yeah. yeah, totally. And he he would look at the early years and say they're all dressed the same, and they were a harmonious group. And by the end, they were all dressed differently and all doing their own things. And and their music wasn't. I think I mean, it's pretty brilliant music all the way through but he he picked up on certain things and and I think that was you know one of the things about him which was just so incredible he never took things at face value so he wanted to know what was the motivation for writing that music um how it was made what the you know I, I don't know how you quite unpack Queen some of Queen's lyrics because they don't really not. make make sense at all um, but he was just intrigued by how these things were put together and what motivated me and 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 how people came together as a group to you know that that the sum of the parts were more than the sum of the individuals um, and I think that really intrigued him um, and we talked about Templeton we talked about um, Ted which were you know some of my most um, other amusing encounters I think it leads me to my very last question. I did promise we'd try and wind up promptly, which yes. is, you know, as you mentioned, it's an extraordinary responsibility thinking back to that horrible weekend at the end of 2020 and what it's meant. That there's a, uh, an extraordinary responsibility to promote and preserve Rabbi Sachs's legacy um, to ensure that his remarkable ideas and writings are accessible and remain influential well beyond his lifetime. So what exciting plans do you have in store for the Legacy Trust, which is now charged with that remark, with that weighty responsibility? So I think, as you said, you know, our responsibility is to make his um, ideas and his teachings as, as accessible as we possibly can um, to as wide a possible audience that, you know, anyone that wants to access his teachings can do so. Um, so we just launched a brand new website. We soft, soft launched it. We will um, make a, a a bit more of a song and dance about it in the next few weeks it's been um, noticed, it's been noticed. Um, the idea is to bring as much as we possibly can and create a digital archive um, a digital portal where you can find almost anything that is the idea almost anything that he's written uh, spoken uh, any all the video content um, we created indexes of of his books and that's an ongoing process um, we're beginning translations um, and we've got some um, amazing support in in getting those translations done because um, we're beginning to see that you know people in France and Germany and Spain and, and those languages are spoken around the world want to read him one of the biggest projects we've got um, please God, which is really underway at the moment is, is in Israel. Um, we found that there is a real appetite for, to get Rabbi Sachs's teachings um, and ideas into the curriculum in schools in Israel. Uh, the, we're working with Ms. Rada um, We have, it's, it's a very clever, maybe clever uh, situation in Israel that there is a funnel um, to work with. So getting him into the schools, into the Mechinot, um, into public society, we're finding lots of people Lots more people are reading him in Israel than than ever before. So Israel is one of them. Education system um, here and in and in the states. Uh, so sort of in the diaspora, um, publications bringing back uh, some of his publications that are out of print, um, bringing them back into print. We are hoping to um, do something with Safaria to make sure that um, his material is accessible on there. It's a lot. It's a. It's a. It's a website where a lot of teachers uh, find resources and create resources uh, for the classroom and beyond. Um, on the publication site, again, translating um, as many of his books into as many languages as we as we can, um, where there's a, an appetite, and um, even so far as as, as Arabic, um, we've been approached um, to, to translate a couple of his books and po possibly more. Um, into Arabic and, and create something at a, in the UAE, which is, is quite phenomenal. Um, and global initiatives, um, you know, in we, we uh, you were part of the Communities in Conversation 
um, last year around the art site. And please God, we'll, we'd like to take that um, wider um, this coming year. The sex conversation, we would like to do it in, um, in Israel next time and then maybe America. Just giving people an opportunity to learn from Rabbi Sachs to teach him um, and make sure that his, his teachings and ideas live on for generations to come. Well, I think that is a very good place to stop. Um, I think that given that we've run out of time, I'm not going to take questions. No one's been kind of like bugging me or sending messages anyway. So Joanna, thank you so much for your time and for a really interesting, honest and quite kind of quite fun conversation. We've touched on some serious things as well. Um, it's been a pleasure. And I know that uh, the, the, we have a, an audience who have listened to it online and the expectation is that, um, that people will listen to it. I think subsequently it'll be um, uploaded a little later to the Shul YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Looking forward to continue working with you. Me too. Thank you. <laughs>